Okay, our next speaker is Ralph Osterhout. Is, if Ralph can make his way back to the back of the stage, we'll get all set up. I'll give you a little bit of information about him if you um, don't know him already. Ralph is an American inventor, designer, and serial entrepreneur and CEO of Osterhout Design Group. In his career, he has developed over 2,000 different products and hundreds of separate product lines for companies ranging from startups to Fortune 500s, as well as government. He founded ODG, Osterhout Design Group in 1999 after several decades founding, building, and selling companies in consumer products, sporting goods, defense contracting, personal electronics, and high-tech toys. ODG has had a long and successful history with heads-up displays and wearable computing, working closely with government and corporate partners, and recently made news from their work with BMW to create mini augmented reality. Please join me in welcoming Ralph Osterhout to the stage. Thank you, Rob. Everybody here at the show is looking at augmented reality and virtual reality, and this, I've had so many people come by and bumped into people in the hallways that there's a real question. I'm not sure I understand the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality. I would say two things to you. Before I start in simple terms here, if you think of it this way, augmented reality is you're looking at the real world, you're in the real world, and you layer computer-generated information typically in front of you without obstructing your ability to do something, and you enhance your knowledge or capabilities of what's going on in the real world. Virtual reality is where you uh, immerse yourself in a, an environment or imagery that was created at some other time, and you are able to engage in games, you're able to engage in watching certain films and all, in a very immersive experience that's different than if you're connected to your real world and see what's around you. So both have their place. In time, there's an inevitable convergence of augmented reality and virtual reality, each to the benefit of what? I would tell you this as I start. The first thing I would say, most importantly, is this. Don't get hung up on AR, VR. What this is really about is head-worn computing is going to transform our lives in the most profound ways. And those people who do not think head-worn computing makes a lot of sense. I'm going to say, has anybody ever seen anybody with eyeballs on their butt? Your eyes, your sense of smell, your hearing, taste, everything is conveniently located right on your head, as is the fastest analog computer ever invented or duplicated. So let's just assume it's a hell of a good place to have a computer. That being said, let's get to it. The real key, the blueprint for success for AR and VR, is you need to have glasses that are truly self-contained, ultimately. And to do, to do it, what do you really need? It needs to really be hands-free, head-worn. That's a no-brainer. It has to have lots of memory. It needs fast processing. Today, you can get eight core processors, right? You're going to have 16, 24, and in some instances, uh, math engines that are 100 cores that are tiny in a chip, less than one inch square. So you're going to have screaming processing capability that would have been a supercomputer 10 years ago. With that and with wireless enablement, what can they be? Don't think of just AR, VR. Say it's going to be the next big computer, the next big thing. Remember, the iPod took six years to hockey stick. The iPhone took six months. The iPad took six weeks. How fast do you think it's going to be when you realize that you can store and carry around with you 250,000 books of any size, 1,000 HD movies, the capability of recognizing virtually anything anywhere, the ability to do first age on anyone anywhere, the ability to go to any country in the world and have people look at you and talk to you in any language that you don't understand but your glasses do real-time translation and you can speak back to them but you don't have to know the language because you can have something the size of a peanut butter jar lid in your pocket that's a very high amplitude, very, very thin, lightweight amplifier speaker that's Bluetooth enabled from your glasses. And what it will do is when you talk in simple English, convert it immediately to the language of choice with your voice, nature, and characteristics and inflections. Suddenly, you have just broken the barriers to communication anywhere, any place. So as we move on, this is my cut where I think things are. And if you had the, the opportunity, and I'd be very grateful if you did, to stop by and see, these are very real. They're here, they're now, they're not maybe a sort of. So these are very fast, and when I did it in this look to look like sunglasses, 
No matter what, nobody in the world is going to wear glasses that make you look like birth control devices or pedophiles are us. It's not going to happen. So as we move on, what is the kind of things that are important? When you have screaming fast processing in your head, you are going to generate heat. Anybody who doesn't think so is either a booger-eating moron or blissfully disengaged from facts. So you need to be able to cool circuitry. You have to be the ability to give you flawless image quality. What do I mean? I mean you cannot see any pixels. Go. Don't take my word for it. Assuming I'm an absolute swindler. Go and see. You want no pixels because you want photo quality. No one wants to look at a picture of Tiffany or Timmy with lots of little blocky pixels. So photo quality is something that we're fairly obsessed about. You want to have, of course, stereo. You want to have, importantly, the ability to have 3D. Why? Because it gives you depth of field and allows you to do things in the augmented world and ultimately in the virtual world you cannot duplicate with monocular viewing. It has to be binocular. Now, you may not know this, but the variation in interpupillary dis distance in human beings varies about one inch from center. So some people look like their head was put in an almond press, and some other people look like a hammerhead. Another one's attractive, but we need to accommodate everybody. So trying to figure out how you could make optics that you put on the glasses, and they will work. You'll have convergence and beautiful stereo imagery anywhere, anytime is a big deal. I don't care that you had sort of a grim 3D movies in the past. Get over it. We're stereo vision. We're not going to give up an eye because you don't think you need it this way. So let's do ourselves a favor. Let's make head-worn computing, AR, VR devices, give them beautiful, rich stereo. Moving along, the product, what you want is you want high definition. And when I tell you right now, you can put a, a, a billion pixel camera in the front. It doesn't make any difference if you can't see them. So there's a limitation of what the eye can see, and you've only got 15 degrees of absolute high resolution in the fovea in the center of your eye. Outboard of that, things fall off really fast. If you don't believe me, put your hands out and wiggle your fingers and start to bring them around and see how close to center they have to get before you can actually see your individual fingers. It's an interesting experience. So what do you need to do with these glasses? You're not going to always be watching a movie. You're not going to always be in an augmented whatever. You do need to be able to read your emails. You do need to be able to get on and browse. You want to know where you are anywhere in the world within half the thickness of your body, because it's a good idea. You want to know where you're going precisely. You want to be able to read signs. You want total security. You want to walk down the street and say, private banking, pin number 7214, transfer funds, and nobody can hack you, nobody can do anything about it, because they don't know where your bank is, they don't know what branch, they don't know your account numbers. You have total security, because the, the encryption in them is twice the security level of your friendly bank. Moving on, you want to capture video. So effectively, it is a high-res video camera on your head that you see exactly what you're feeling in real time. So you've got the viewfinder in front of you. You don't have to speculate or put a very wide-angle lens to capture what you want to capture. Because if you don't like it, erase it and redo it. Finally, it's got to be faster than a rape tape. If it's not high-speed computing, high-speed graphics manipulation, it's going to do you no good, and it will short-circuit the capabilities that you deserve. So how do you interface? Well, you can talk, but talking gets exhausting really fast, believe me. So you can do other things, and one of the big ones is there's a thing called a wireless ring control that fits on your index finger. I picked this for a reason. Look at your thumb. It's the most articulating digit on your body. And so what you can do is you have four speed buttons. You push one button, you're in email. Push another button, you're browsing. Push another one, you're filming video. Push another one, you're watching movies. And they're all programmable. And it weighs a fraction of an ounce. So when you can do that, we can also communicate with your watch. I do. And you can, of course, also use any smartphone to interface and bi-directionally. What you mean is it's not an orphan. You're not asking people to throw away anything. You're expanding their world. The world you think of now is you think of enterprise, industrial, government. Why? Because we're not ready to cost-wise to put them out unless there's a lot of financial horsepower behind you to get glasses out that need to be under $1,000. And you won't really care because it's going to be a laptop computer, it's going to be your tablet and the works. Why? Because the image you see is not a dinky little image, even though the screen is the size of my fingernail, because in front of you at arm's length, it's a 24-inch screen. Or in your room, 
at home or anywhere, your hotel room, it's a 65-inch high-definition screen. That's the magic. It doesn't care if it's bright, doesn't care if it's dim, anywhere in the world, 24-7, walking down the street, you can watch whatever you want to watch. And as this is bizarre as it may seem, you can look up directly at the sun and play a movie and watch it with the sun right behind you, even though the, what you're looking on the screen is transparent. So there is magic to be had. It takes a lot of technology, a couple of million hours, but what's, what's time amongst friends? So here you see you can do maintenance and repair, call up any manual. We had some of the major airline manufacturers you know of in the world in, and they realized they could be in a, a wing section of a plane, they can be in an automobile, race cars, anything, anywhere, and call up all the manuals, procedures, repair instructions for anything, anywhere, 24-7. You're on vacation with your family in Africa, and somebody slips and calls and cuts their leg open. And what do you do? You may not have a doctor nearby. In Botswana, it's free medical care and free education, unlimited. You may be 14 hours before you get to a hospital, but it's free. So you may want to be able to have your glasses, turn it on, and you've got triaging applications as your camera looks down, sees the bleed, says it's an arterial bleed, apply direct pressure, elevate the limb in any language. So now um, your ability to do things, say, look after your family, transform your lives, becomes something unbelievably magical. You can imagine you can in the warehouses and factories and, and the huge fulfillment houses, of which there's many now, think of Amazon, Walmart, Kmart, Target, ad nauseum. You might have hundreds of thousands of pickers in the warehouse. Le English is their second language. Would you like the camera to read the packages, read the QRC and barcodes, and verify and scan it for you automatically? And it does it three times in a row like they do, but it does it in a second. So what happens is one of the major retailers online in the world said if you can shave 10 seconds off the handling time for packages, I'll drop 100 million to the bottom line. You think that's motivation for a customer? I do. Medical, we had people in our booth. You need to know people right now are performing vascular surgery right now performing it with the glasses on in real time. People are doing brain surgery now with the glasses on in real time because they can see everything perfectly, but they can call up MRIs and CAT scans and any other information they want in real time and share it because we have telepresence between all the glasses. Furthermore, anybody in the world can see what those surgeons are doing in real time. So that can be advantageous. So tie it all together. This is what you might get. Okay, now, let's go one step further. There's the inevitable argument, AR, VR, and there's people who are proponents of each jump up and down and call the other people invaders and sinners if they're not in the same area they believe in. What if you just said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why don't we do something this? What if we were to combine AR and VR, where you can have AR, walk, run, ride a motorcycle, climb, exercise, do anything you want anywhere in the world, and see your world perfectly, and have access to any information that's available on the internet 24-7 anywhere in the world. That's useful. But now you may also say, I want to play Call of Duty, I want to play Grand Prix racing game, whatever, and I want to have a total immersive experience by being in VR, shut out the lights around me, and whatever. So there you had your glasses. So imagine you're going to add an ounce and a half of weight click, in essentially 10 seconds or 15 seconds maximum if you're a little fumbling, and you turned your AR glasses into true VR that's totally isolationist. Number one, you've got to remember, this is your normal cinema-wide screen and your big flat screens in your homes. Let's go a little bit bigger and jump our field of view out effectively to that. So now you have a big wide screen, and this is like your cine-wide big digital theaters that you go to and pay a lot of money to watch. Now, let's tie this all together, and you might have something that looks just like this. Pop out your lenses that can magnetically retain, so two opaque lenses snap in place. That takes a few seconds. Now you snap in a lightweight part with foam on it, and now you have an immersive experience, and you're in it. And the beauty of VR, that immersive experience with full stereo sound, surround sound, everything that's built in the glasses is there. So now, 
The question inevitably is, fine, this is all talk, but tell me when. Here's the bottom line. The R7s that are showing you over there now will deliver in August in quantity. And the R8 that we call R8 there, and they can be any color in the rainbow, is planned to be in mass for the consumer in 2016. So now the real question is, do you make things that only fit certain people, or do you really want to say, it's a field of dreams, we can do it today, the technology exists, go over there, don't believe me. What you can do is maybe accommodate nearly everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. You bet. Do we have time for, are you okay with one or two sure. questions? Okay. Some questions here in the audience. Put up your hand, we have mic runners. Yep, if you want to run. <laughs> Next year we'll need drones to deliver mics, maybe, I don't know. There we go. I'm curious as to whether you can put corrective lenses in those glasses. Right now, 64% of Americans wear glasses, and that's increasing as time goes on. Uh, the answer is yes, and if you go to Singapore, it's about 91%. So I understand the need. Uh, see these? This is not by accident because I think I look better. I need them. We all need them. So the bottom line is if you're blind, crippled, and crazy, you can snap in the corrective inside the glasses for your prescription in about five seconds. It's all done. You can go see them. Be delighted to show you. Another question? I'm trying to see out there. Yep, There's, okay. Yes. Um, I was curious about uh, the widespread adoption of glasses in consumer space. Because what uh, you showed us what can be done uh, with the glass can be done with the smartphone. So what will be my motivation to buy a glass when I can do everything in, like browsing or emails uh, with my smartphone? Too many firearms. I couldn't hear it. Great. Can you, can you tell me that again so I can understand it? Uh, so it's I me, not you. Uh, so my question is uh, about adopt, uh, adopting glasses in consumer space. So um, as you, s you showed that we can use to uh, browse, read our emails, and all those things. Mm -hmm. But all those things can be done with a smartphone. So why would I go by? Uh, go thank you. I, I want to go down and kiss you for that. You really the question is, I got a lot of stuff in the smartphone. Why do I need these glasses? So I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever been outside anywhere, sat on a bench, sat in your backyard, sitting on your porch and fallen asleep? Ever? Would that be a yes? Okay. And so if you dropped your little tablet, how would that work out for you? Maybe not so good? Here's the thing about a smartphone. How many people can go out in bright sun right now? I've got an iPhone 6 Plus. I think it's fabulous. Got a bunch of other ones. Not one smartphone is easy to read in bright sun. Yes or no? Who says, oh, no problem. I clear as a bell. Beautiful. Bright sun. No. Because the bottom line is when our resolution went up in smartphones, the pixels got tinier and tinier and tinier, which gave no room for photons of light from the sun to get behind those pixels and backlight them with a transflective display. So the sheer fact of the matter is the beautiful part about head-worn that has nothing to do with me, it has to do with physics, is one, it's body position independent. You can lay on the beach, be in your bed, be in an airplane, take a nap and watch your movies. You don't have to have your screen here and your turn sideways trying not to be bothered. It's perfect. If you have a loved one and yourself is in a hospital in your bed and you don't feel well, you can watch your movies with no penalty. So atmospheric conditions independent, day or night, one. Body position independent, two. Hands free. You are in the mall and you have children or grandchildren or whatever you have. You're walking along holding their hands. And now what do you do? How do you push the cart and hold the kids' hands too? If you have incoming calls from your daughter who says, I've got a problem, could you pick me up? Your hands are free to do whatever. You are enabled. And I think we have an obligation as scientists, engineers, inventors, and designers to say, how do we stop making people accommodate their needs? Why don't we make technology accommodate them? That's fantastic. Big round of applause for Ralph, everybody. Thank you.